Hello, my name is John Mount. I want to present a rather rapid and short history of AI and machine learning in the context of learning some terminology for artificial, of artificial intelligence for discussing decision intelligence and decision quality. Uh, again, my name is John Mount and I'm with WinVector LLC, a company that specializes in data science consulting and training. Bit of a disclaimer, this talk is produced only to orient us on certain terms. I myself am not a large language model expert or current practitioner. My background is a PhD in computer science and a lot of experience in probability and statistics and data science. And it's going to be a bit of a potted history. I'm going to show the way they think, the way I think the world evolved recently. The goal is to put things in context and give us the ability to talk about AI topics among non-specialists. The outline I've settled on is I'm going to go over the statistical foundations of machine learning. So this is where statistics and machine learning were very dominant for quite a while in the field. Then I'll go to deep learning, the neural net topic, and I'll get to what currently is going on in AI. The statistical foundations of machine learning are what most people think of when they think of machine learning. And like almost so many things, it used to be marketed under an AI name. What it is, is a collection of very good statistical methods, such as linear logistic regression, um, ensemble methods such as random forest, and many others, support vector machines. This is what's classically meant by machine learning. And most of these methods are statistical in nature. And the capstone book is the elements of statistical machine learning and also the pattern recognition. How this worked is it deals with tabular data. Tabular data goes back to the Jacquard loom and the Hollerith card, and it's also the statistical concept of a design matrix. But what it is, is every row is an instance and every column is a measurement type in a grid. So this row, this data set's about penguins. The first row is one penguin, and this column is the gender of the penguin, in this case, male. This is what's called structured or tabular data, and this is what we would expect with classic statistical machine learning methodology. The brilliance of it is how to produce training data. It, in my experience, how you build data has been the biggest breakthrough in every level of AI and machine learning. For supervised machine learning or structured or tabular data, what we would do is declare one column as the outcome or dependent variable. We would make this a column that's very valuable to us and is perhaps not cheap to work out non-invasively, such as possibly gendering a penguin or knowing how many sales we made in the next quarter. We would take every other column from an instance and label the ones that are easy to measure as explanatory variables. So under this rubric, all we're trying to do is memorize a function or relation. We're trying to build an approximation of how is the outcome predicted by the explanatory variables. And this is just function approximation. And how do you do this? Well, you wait three months for the sales outcome to happen and merge that with older data. And now you have an example table saying, here's the future as a function of the past. Now, and then you learn an approximation of that table as an actual implementable function. Now, there are some terminology traps, which are inessential difficulties, so we can get around them, but many of the related fields, data science, statistics, ML, machine learning, deliberately use similar words for different meanings. For instance, in statistics, inference has always meant the fitting or learning of parameters of a model, whereas in machine learning engineering in particular, it is now called the application of a model. So it's a very different meaning. Uh, prediction is usually just not really full forecasting. It's just the application of a model again. Um, independent variables is the historic horrible name for explanatory variables. Regression is the traditional name for predicting a number. It comes from original criticism or regression to mediocrity. And the one I want to talk about just for a second is classification. That really is just the prediction of a value from a small number of categories. Is this the letter A or is it the letter B or the letter C? And it almost never should be done. It's much, much, much better to predict the probability of being the letter A instead of making a determination. Now, there's also an important difference between machine learning and classical modeling like you may have seen in decision science. Uh, in classical modeling, you might model a factory as a system that takes aggregate numbers 
is inputs and aggregate numbers of outputs. At a certain temperature and humidity, it may have a certain defect rate. In machine learning, you would actually model individual items going through the machine, predict whether each one is a defect or not, and get any aggregate defect rate as a function of variables by aggregating up. Very different techniques. Um, the machine learning one is actually rather hard to extend in some cases. Once we got out of classical statistics, we got into deep learning. Now, this the classical statistical machine learning was sort of dominant from the late 1980s up until around the 2000s. Deep learning is the return, once again, triumphant of neural nets. Neural nets were built by a biological um, analogy, like this top figure is a neuron, and the next figure is what is called the perceptron or the activation of a neural net. Uh, perceptron was one particular one. It takes some inputs, adds them up, and then computes some simple function of that one number and passes that on. These neural units are actually just expressions. Then they're composed into huge expression graphs, and whereas this last figure of an image uh, is every pixel in this diagram is a single, what we used to call a neural net. So it's very complicated. Like this input image might be a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels by three color planes or three million numbers. And it's just represented as a square. And all these other layers are just as large and not pictured are the billions and billions of wires that make this net. This uh, is a diagram of something that's probably doing some image processing and then classifying this into, is it a robot? Is it a cartoon? Is it a man? I can tell it's classifying because the output layer is drawn as a line, which means it's a series of light bulbs that light up if it's in the class and not if not in the class. Deep learning was not just large neural nets. It was also some name brand techniques that took a lot of time to develop. Stochastic gradient descent improvements for the optimizer to solve for the neural net weights. The drawing is called the topology. The neural net isn't functional to you know with weights. Um, dropout as a protection against overfitting. Overfitting is when the net does very well on training data but fails on future application data. One of the very many reasons we do not evaluate models on training data, we do it on held out data. And uh, simulating on censorship to generate more training data. This exploded in the 2010s. The on censorship idea is the thing to take away from technologies if you're going to learn it. It's how to build training data out of the large amount of data that sits around. The technique was first made famous in the word to vec paper of 2013. And the idea was you take a large text corpus, in this case it was Google News, and you look for sentences or, or just phrases. And you take a phrase like as right as rain, and you encode its input as right as question mark, and then the output or dependent value is you're supposed to predict rain when you see as right as. This encoding uses something called one hot, where Every word in English has a zero one variable. So that's tens of thousands of zero one variables. And every position in the sentence has a different set of such variables. So you have a complete model of the words for this first word position where the as is, another one for right, and so on. So huge number of imaginary wires going in. And how does it encode an answer? It has one wire or notional wire for every possible output word. And the idea is the wire with the right answer should be hot and all the others cold. Um, so again, I said the success of this was word to vec It can basically write. You give it text. The missing word is the next word in the text. You shift it over, and it goes for another next word. So it could limp out imitations of its training text. It also, by cutting the net open and examining its internal activations, you could re-encode this concept as right as rain as a mere two to 300 variables instead of the hundreds of thousands it was in the zero one encoding. And this new encoding called an embedding had the neighborly pro uh, property that similar words coded closer to each other than dissimilar words. This is where things took off. This is a graph from OpenAI. The x-axis is the year. The y-axis is petaflop days, which is a unit of computation, but just think of it as a, an equivalent unit of dollars. From 1958, where the perceptron, which was the first neural net I showed you, made the news, up through around 2012, the doubling expense of getting a, note, a super noteworthy publication doubled every two years, very much like Moore's Law. So in this regime, you have moneyed labs buying a state-of-the-art computer at a reasonable price and combining it with some good ideas and getting a pub.
Now, from 2010 on, the doubling time exceed, speeds up to 3.4 months. That's not Moore's law. This is money. So now, to get a notable result in machine learning and deep learning, you need more money than the person that did it before you. So you need to buy a computer that is further and further ahead of the state of the art. And that's what's being done. It's also been described as a, a money attractor, that money attracts money. This explosion led to what we're now calling AI. AI is a term that changes meaning every year, but the current term is much like this. The components of what we're currently calling AI are called large language models, or LLMs for short. They've been dominant since around 210s. Deep neural nets are one of the concepts. They have specific um, neural net ideas, transformers, autoencoders, selective attention, and they're self-supervised or semi-supervised. They're made possible. The billions of parameters within them are set by building enormous training corpuses by reprocessing data into training data in the methods we showed. They also have prompt engineering, where the user's query is replaced by a little essay that includes the user query, like instructions saying write in a polite way, things like that. They have post-processing, such as retrieval, retrieval augmented generation, or RAGs, which means it replaces a bit of the answer with looked up answers, and so on. They also have human taggers, and they are operated behind an API. You can download and run some of these systems, but they're not comparable to the ones that are behind service interfaces like ChatGPT3. Here is an actual use of an AI. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I am sharing all the slides at the link given at the start of the talk. Should have emphasized that. But I asked, what does the following code do? And I typed in some Python code. I didn't put any special markers to show I was moving from words to code. And I put that into the free service of ChatGPT3. ChatGPT3.5 gave the following answer, which obviously we will not have time to go over. But the point was the answer was correct and detailed and informative. It, it said what arithmetic was being done on letters and numbers and that this sort of arithmetic was usually done for spiritual things like numerology. And that was what the example code was. And this was writ code that was written by my partner, so this was not pasted from off the net. Though we have reasons to believe it's seen a million things like this, that familiarity breeds the results. So what are the AIs doing? Well. What has been given up is we're not modeling agents or intelligence or domains anymore. We're modeling text and the structure of text. Uh, the rags or retrieval augmented generation is part of it. And the goal of AIs and the machine learnings before them is to produce results that are statistically indistinguishable from correct answers. And this should be disturbing. It means they make, once their results become hard to test, they are done. Now, uh, this took Cyril's criticism called the Chinese room, which originated as a criticism, a room where every question is uh, on a three by five card attached by a string to the answer, say it's translation into Chinese, is that room have knowledge? If every question is taped to every answer, does that represent knowledge? And that was an AI criticism. And then it got converted to a blueprint that you just take all of the Wikipedia, every book, legal or illegal, tons of the web, tons of the news, tons of Twitter, run it through, build the training data, use the uncensorship or exposure deletion model to turn this um, inert data into active training goals. So um, some things still apply, though they don't say them anymore. GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, still applies. These uh, AIs notoriously retain um, gender and racial prejudices from their training data. And um, it may no longer be easy to give an AI a novel question. Um, if you've thought of this is my Captain Kirk trick the AI question, somebody's asked it, they've written it down, and if it didn't do well, they've tried again. So now there are some issues working with AIs. I strongly don't think we're looking at a Terminator scenario. Um, we'll find out. Right. But we're more looking at a Wizard of Oz regulatory capture scenario. That the corporations that are ahead in these AIs are basically attempting to throw more regulation than they've ever seen when they were developing them, so nobody else develops a second one. Um, Jan LeCun has written about this. Also, we're experiencing these AIs behind a pennies per task API. They do respond faster than a human team could, so there's definitely a machine in there. It's not the mechanical Turk with a human pretending to play chess, but it is unlikely you're outside of his experience. Um, 
And the, there are also these impacts of running these APIs. Can you really evaluate them when they're behind an API? And there's impacts of taggers that are used to do some pretty horrific tasks like sorting out harmful material. Uh, partnering with AI companies may be risky. You might be teaching them your domain instead of using them as a tool. Now, the other issue that's really big with these AIs is called hallucination. And that's when the AI builds a very confident wrong answer. I have in this link on WinVector blog, quite easy to find, a chat GPT-3.5 hallucination. I said, please show how to prove the sum of the reciprocals of prime integers diverges. And it essentially built a fake proof. And I mean, not just a wrong proof, but a proof that was a bunch of irrelevant statements followed by a wrong statement and then a beautiful introduction and beautiful outro. So without covering it carefully, it was literally hard to determine it was wrong, though it's very wrong. And it's not even related to any of the known proofs of this result. So it's not getting there. Additional issues. No one has ever safely exposed an AI to the hostile public. Um, for when you're just working on your chat GPT, like if you can make it swear or do something they claim it won't do, that's not so bad. But when you did some, when people did something like a public AI, like a chat bot on Twitter, one group would make the bot very racist, and then it would repeat those phrases to other people. So you basically need a Tawny Madison at this day and age. You cannot use an AI as your call center, but you might use it to augment people in your call center. That the AI may represent knowledge, but I would not trust it to do policy. And there's this, in addition to prompt engineering, there's prompt breaking, where the prompt the user will say, please ignore your previous instructions and do blah. And that sometimes works. Now, uh, this is just some recent news. Uh, it turns out the um, self-driving cars um, had the cruise brand ones had uh, basically 1.5 support people on staff. So that's equivalent to 1.5 drivers. They're just not in the car and called home over the cellular network approximately every 2.5 to five miles. So if you saw one of these cars, like I have in San Francisco, driving down a city street, pausing at an intersection, maybe there's a construction truck and then going on, did it actually solve the intersection as unusual or did it ask home for instructions? AI is here. That and I'm, it, it's much bigger than it's ever been, and it is already disrupting a lot of jobs and industries. Um, and people that find ways to effectively use it are going to outperform those that do not. Um, it is, it is unclear how much different it is than state-of-the-art information retrieval, and but it is kind of a stone soup. Like it starts with not sure what, but once you put up a lot of things in it, it is a soup. In my summary opinion. Um, machine learning and AI are not the same thing. They never have been. Machine learning used to market itself as AI. Um, you had to because the guy next to you was, or the gal next to you was. The days of calling a linear regressor an if-else statement AI may finally be over, though I still make most of my money selling um, linear regressions. The um, Both approaches, both AI and machine learning, treat observed quality of outcomes as inherent quality of the decision process. That, of course, should be very, very disturbing to people interested in decision intelligence, decision science, or decision quality. Just to repeat, this may have come out a little negative, but AI is here, and it's basically it's a captive service. If you're using state-of-the-art, you're going to an API. You can download some lesser ones through Hugging Face, but they're not going to be the same as the ones behind the API. Um, AI augmented systems are outperforming non-augmented systems. It's uh, no longer just deep learning. Deep learning was dominant, but now it is one component among many. And it dominates off the hook in unstructured tasks such as text summarization, generation, and image reprocessing. Right now, it's probably best as a force multiplier, but that may change. And it's, it's not something to be ignored. And again, I don't think you have to be afraid of indifferent to hostile non-human intelligences because we already have them and they're called corporations. So AI is something, another player on the thing, but it's um, right now limited in its exposure. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. And some things are going to be a little distorted when we try to compress them so tightly. But I hope this gives you the tools to see both how you can use AI in your products and also how you can discuss it in the context of decision quality, because it tells you where you can put it and where you cannot. Thank you very much for your time.